welcome to the talk, Teaching Computers ABCs, a quick intro to natural language processing. Looking at previous talks and looking at the audience, it seems from, from, an, from an audience standpoint, everybody knows the math here of NLP. So what I want to offer in this talk is some of the math, some of the Python libraries that we use, but also some of the humanistic approach to NLP. Like how do we view text? It, is it how, when, when we do embeddings, when we do all these representations, is it with a mindset of how do we understand text and so that it can translate to better embeddings, to better um, word representation? And also what I also wanted to offer is more of a uh, productionized view of how the whole NLP pipeline works. What, what pipeline or what process really makes it all the way to production? Because we can get to many POCs. In many companies, we can get to many POCs, but very few really make it all the way to production. But again, I would like to caveat this talk that all the views and projects are my own and do not represent my employer. <laughs> all right. So here's our outline. First, we talk about NLP and use cases, and I actually have made two really quick POCs that demonstrate two NLP functionalities. Then let's talk about embeddings, and then thirdly, we will talk about the NLP pipeline end-to-end -end from a data engineer and a data scientist standpoint, and the Python libraries that we use along the way. And lastly, let's apply those at that NLP pipeline to actual use cases. So all good? Okay. So, from text and meaning to vectors. So let's take like three steps back, five steps back. How do we teach a child about language? When you have a little kid, how do you teach him or her about language? You say, oh, you start with the letters A, you pronounce it as A, ah, right? And then P, P, L, E, until the child knows that, okay, that means apple. Then the child understands apple. You show him the apple, then he understands apple. He takes a bite of the apple. He knows, oh, it's sweet. And then also when he goes to his grandma, grandma's house, and his grandma makes an apple pie, the child is very happy. So he, he, he equates happiness with apple. So as humans, we have five senses as inputs. We have rich knowledge representation. We can represent sight, sound, smell. But computers cannot. Computers can only understand zeros and ones. So it's up to us. How do we convert not just words into numbers, but how do we convert the sentiment, the, how do we convert the meaning of words, the sentiment that it evokes, the relationship of words among other words as numbers? So that's the humanistic approach of NLP. And we can go through many, many models, but I know I should say this in my, in my fifth slide, but I just cannot help myself. Got to read the text. At the very start of any NLP program, or of any NLP program, you got to read what you're trying to automate first. So that goes with the humanistic approach, right? When you try to teach a kid how to learn, when you try to teach a computer how to learn, you've got to understand what you're teaching him. So now from text and meaning, now we go to vectors. And vectors are zeros and ones, so obviously that's how the computer understands text. So let's do the use case one. We have two, we, uh, I have two apps for you that demonstrate NLP uh, use cases. One is information retrieval. So I built an app, again, this is a very PLC app, so called Kindred. So this is a very simplistic app that gets Wikipedia articles and finds the best matches in history. So this slide demo always kind of makes me nervous. All right, there you go. So built in Flask, right? So what we did was um, I used a library in Python called Wiki, Wikipedia, just gets the, uh, the uh, Wikipedia articles. And then um, we did some NLP using TFIDF vectorization, and then just did a simple cosine similarity. So here we have historical figures, and let's say, um, you know, uh, I don't know many of them, but let's say Albert Einstein. One would, one would think that it's similar with other physicists if our algorithms work correctly. So, we submit, and here you get Max Planck, Stephen Hawking, Enrico Fermi, they, they look like physicists to me, so that's fine. Next is, let's try Marilyn Monroe. And uh, just a caveat, I tried these names before I, I made this. <laughs> but you can, it's, it's online, it's in class, you can try it too. So let's see, Marilyn Monroe. So again, this is this this is really basic class. One more. Oh, there you go. There. Thank you. Marilyn Monroe. So she's an American actress. If 
you know, known in the, very popular in the <coughs> 60s, right? And yeah. why is it not working? All right. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there you go. Then you have Greta Barbo, Ingrid Bergman, actresses of the same era. So we just use plain Wikipedia text, not Wikipedia metadata, just plain Wikipedia text to get this. Now that's the first, that's the first use case. This is information retrieval. Now the second use case I want to showcase an NLP uh, uh, usability is text classification for predictions. Now I did this because I just couldn't stop myself. I found a data set um, which has all disasters labeled, right? Because I'm originally from the Philippines and we have lots of you know, natural disasters. So one of the things that they did was they labeled, there's a labeled data set where you put, where there's a tweet and a human labels it like, okay, is this for evacuation? Is this for, you know, is, is there an injured person? So it's good for triage. When you have, when you have a disaster and you have all these tweets coming, you want to know, okay, I want to send, I want to send emergency medical services to here. I want to send uh, my, my police to this one. So it's good for, so let me, let me show you how that works. So. I did not build a dashboard. I use a free, a free, uh, a free trial of a dashboard. And so here are the predicted types that we have. Predicted types are a tweet can be about caution, meaning okay, don't go to this area because there might be some landslides. It could be about evacuation, evacuate the Metro Manila area because there are some landslides. It could be donations, like hey, I want to volunteer my time to help. It could be about infrastructure, a bridge collapsed. Or it could be, oh, there were some injured or some deaths in this area. And so what NLP did was it got the tweets. And then just based from the tweets, it's a movie label classification problem. Said, OK, these go to these predictive types. And also what it did was it did some information extraction and got the place from the tweet so that it can put it in this map. Right? So here, based from the tweet, if it says, somewhere like Cebu, which is in the Visayas, it extracts the place Cebu, and then it would highlight that in the map. And I will tell you all the Python libraries that I all, except for the dashboard, which is not open source, but all the Python libraries under it are, are open source. So those two are really important NLP applications. And I think also like now as NLP is nearing maturity, one of the really important things that we need to think about is how do we harness NLP, like think of it from a product standpoint, what are the use cases that we can get out of NLP? Because I went to a couple of meetups in New York and two preeminent VCs really said that what do you think is AI, what do you think is the really like things that go well in AI in the next five to 10 years? And you know what they said? They said NLP, because we're sitting in a vast trove of unstructured data just waiting to be mined. And even simple models, if you just try mining that, you can get a lot. All right, so now we've talked about the use cases. Now I hope everybody's excited about NLP and just, you know, what unstructured data do you have and what use cases can you get. Let's go to the embeddings, right? What are embeddings? So embeddings are a collection of, of methods and how we represent words into numbers. Or in other words, it's vectorization. How do we get these words and vectorize them? So there are two types of embeddings, aka vectorization, frequency-based or probabilistic-based. So frequency-based example would be count vectorizers where it's a simple bag of words model. Or it could be TFIDF, meaning that you take into account inverse document frequency with your term frequency. Or the second type of embeddings, aka vectorization, is probabilistic, where you have, well, you could have your own model, but there are so many pre-trained models, and I guess the next talk also talks about a pre-trained model called GLOVE. GLOVE, GLOVE, or how do you pronounce that? So, so probabilistic, what I use here as an example is a word to vec model, where under the hood it uses a neural net. So instead of your vector of numbers of either counts, you get a vector of probabilities. So those are the two types of embeddings. So here, in the interest of giving you a a really concrete way on how to calculate embeddings. I chose, um, uh, I chose a uh, 
frequency-based embedding for count and EFIDF for two reasons. Number one, because I don't have enough time to explain all those embeddings. And number two, what I notice when people deploy stuff to production, especially if they're new, what I notice, they go for the, for the most complex model right away, which is always go for the simple model first because you always want to have a baseline model. So whenever you start any project, my, I mean, my suggestion, take it with a grain of salt, is always start with a simple model so that later on you can build off that and you can have metrics and you say, okay, now it warrants a GPU. Because as somebody evaluating the project, I would say, okay, why can't the simple model do this? Or what's the simple model you tried first? So that's why, and then understand your simple model. That's why in the first part of my talk, I really emphasize reading your text and having a humanistic view of, okay, what are we trying to teach here? So let's say, let's go to our frequency frequency-based embeddings. So let's say you have only three documents. And this is taken from the seminal paper from, from Salten. This is in the 80s, like the very first paper on indexing. So let's say you have three documents. Shipment of gold damaged in fire. The delivery of silver arrived in silver truck. Shipment of gold arrived in a truck. That's all you care about, those three documents. The first thing you want to do is assign term IDs to each of the individual terms, right? That's the first thing you want to do because the, word, the machine cannot understand shipment. Now this begs the question of what do I want to put in my vocabulary? For count-based embeddings, you have to be very conscious of do I want a stop word or do I not want a stop word? Do I want to include a, in, of? So those are the decisions you want to make when you do count, when you do frequency-based embeddings. For a probabilistic base, it probably doesn't matter very much because it learns from the context around it. But for count-based embedding, especially if you do, you know, unigram or bigram, it's very sensitive to what you put into your dictionary. So, okay, fine. Now we have now our term IDs here, zero to 10. Let's say, because you only have a vocabulary of 10 words. Let's do the very simple one, bag of words. What does it do? It basically counts. So now you count. Now instead of your document one being shipment of gold damage and fire, your document one is one zero one zero zero blah blah blah. Your document two is this one and this one. That's great. You know. Now you represent it in a way that is kind that kind of makes sense. And the intuition behind it is the more often the word appears in the sentence, the more it represents the meaning of the sentence. That's the intuition of the bag of words model. But we can do better, right? So the next one is, let's try the TF-IDF model, which means the term frequency or inverse document frequency model, which goes beyond the term frequency approach and <coughs> makes and penalizes words that appear more frequently in the corpus, right? So if your word car, let's say your word, Let's say your word shipment arrives in the three documents, shipment, shipment, shipment. Then it means that shipment is not really, dis it's not really such a discriminative word to describe a document because it appears in all three. You have, so let's say gold appears only in one. So gold now is more descriptive of that document. That's why its score is higher. So you do some computations here, and now instead of one, zero, one, one, whatever, you now get 0, 0, 0.477. This is representative of document one, document two, document three. Now you review. All right, let's say, what's the highest score here? Silver. Kind of makes sense, like it's, it's, it explains document two. Uh, what are, and then you compare here. Uh, arrived, doesn't really make sense, but now if you go to your TF-IDF model, now the words make sense, that they explain the sentence better. So that's the intuition. I would, you know, when you go to work to vet models, they have like a really nice way when you can compute all this, so I would really strongly encourage you to at least go through the exercise of computing because it really gives you the intuition of what goes behind it. So now, you now have your vectorized documents, one, two, and three. That's your corpus, dictionary, your representations, representations, and right. Now that's all great, but that's a unigram representation. Shipment of gold damage in fire. It's good for your first pass. It's good for your baseline embedding. But then now you have to think, what about words like, let's say New York? 
mu is, you have to put them together. You have to make them into a bigram or else it loses its meaning. Now you gotta decide again, right? Do I wanna go for a unigram or do I wanna go for a bigram? And depending on how much compute power, or how much space you have, that also factors in your decision. And the other thing too, now if you wanna go to the more probabilistic um, representations, now you go into uh, skipgram and SIBO, continuous bag of words, and all these things, which I think would be covered in, the, in one of the uh, probabilistic embedding sessions. So what happens in a nutshell, very high level, is that a word is described by the context around it. Shipment is described by off gold. Damage is described by in fire. All this, so now your vectors are getting larger and larger. So those are the decisions you have to make. And you can only make good decisions like that if you read your text. So now we went through the embeddings. I want to go through the NLP pipeline end to end in the Python libraries. All right. So this is my, one of my favorite topics because sometimes when people think of NLP, they think of embeddings. But no, it's the whole pipeline. And you start with your ETL. You start with your extract, transform, and load. And then after that, you go to your EDA, which is your exploratory data analysis. Then third, you go to your pre-process. How do you clean your text? Then after that, you go to your vectorization. Now what kind of embeddings am I gonna use? Then you go to, okay, what am I actually computing for? And now you go to your evaluation metric. How good is this, right? So talking about Python libraries, there's so many, not so many, there are many Python libraries um, concerning NLP. So we have three NLP from my experience. I'm sure there are many, that, there are maybe some that I missed, but in my experience, there are three NLP focused Python libraries. NLTK, Spacey, and Jensen. And also, if you work in industry, one of the things you have to be concerned about is what's the license of these libraries, right? So that's the first question. Are the libraries available? What's the license for it? Is it available for commercial use? Are the pre-trained models available for commercial use? You gotta think of it if you're in industry. Because in academia, everything is free, kind of, right? Except for the tuition, but everything is free in terms of the data. So. NLP focus, so why did I bunch it that why do I bunch them in this way? Because let's say NLTK all has libraries for tokenization, lemmatization, stemming, and all those. So if you decide I'm gonna go the NLP route, you will have functions to tokenize, to lemmatize, to do sentence boundary disambiguation, to do all this. Or if I want to go to Spacey, it also has this. So it doesn't really make sense to use NLTK and Spacey if all the functionalities are ready in one library, or you know, Spacey and Jensen, and so on and so forth. But one note though, it's like Spacey and Jensen, NLTK I feel is more general. Spacey, I think one of its core strengths, and I'm a big user of Spacey, underneath it is Cython, which is fast. So for if you want you know, faster machine learning or faster NLP, I would go to Spacey first, and also it's really good for information extraction. So information extraction task, I, you know, I tend to lean um, towards Spacey. And also for um, rule-based machine learning, heuristic-based, rule-based machine learning, it's really good. Jensen is good for uh, word to vec uh, it's good for summarization, it's good for keyword extraction. So those things. If you, you gotta balance both. So let's say if you want to have a system with really good information extraction and really good summarization, add both. Yeah. Well, what's the worst that could happen? Your your memory footprint would be big anyway. Might as well make it bigger. And so the next thing is the two machine learning focused libraries would be Scikit-Learn from you know, and then if you want to do deep learning, you can do Keras. And what I also realized, which I did it since last week, that Keras also has its own tokenization functions. I haven't tried them um, because usually I, I tend to go to either Spacey, and I say Spacey because NLTK has some commercial limitations, so that's Spacey's open source, so that's why I tend to go there. Um, I haven't used Keras tokenization as well because I always think of Keras for deep learning and you know, other libraries for NLP tasks. But those are the things to keep in mind. To keep your code clean, well-structured, well-organized, you gotta understand what you want at the end of the day. Um, so, let's apply that pipeline 
to our two use cases, right? Oh, by the way, any questions while I proceed? Am I going too fast? No questions? All right. So our first use case was the Kindred app, where we got the matches from history, right? So what I did was the first row is the main pipeline. I highlighted in green the things that I did for the Kindred app. So for the ETL, the data sources, and the format. So the data sources, I got the HTML from Wikipedia. So I used the import Wikipedia from Python and also Beautiful Soup to do some extraction. And then I converted it into JSON. So specifically, I used Beautiful Soup and JSON for that. Now for the EBA, you know what I did for EBA? I just read the document. I just read, I mean, it was a POC app. So what I did was, I'll show you what I did for EBA. So that's a Wikipedia article about Socrates. I read the article. Well, I have to admit, not really as, as well as I should if I would be studying Socrates. But I read it to get the structure of the Wikipedia document. What did I realize? I don't need that, I don't need the notes. It doesn't add any value when I do my similarity comparisons. What I also realized is that the first paragraphs of the Wikipedia is a manually written summary of the article. The second thing I also realized is that the contents, the key, seems to be like keywords of what is important in Socrates' life. So based on these realizations, I, I said, oh, I can remove the notes by using regular expressions. It doesn't add value to my model. I can weigh the, the manual summary at the, at the very top higher, and I can use the table of contents as my quote unquote metadata about the page. So that's how I thought about the problem, just by looking at the structure of the Wikipedia article. So going back, that's kind of how I did the ABA on, on this one. The other one, I promise, I used more scientific methods for the ABA. And then after that was tokenization. I said, OK, it's English words. So I just use simple uh, tokenizer. And I use sentence tokenization from NLTK. And information extraction. Um, I removed the notes at the bottom. And also, I was thinking, should I extract people, places, and things out of that using Spacey, but I decided not to. And then I uh, created my own custom dictionary based on, on that. And I used the stop words from NLTK. It's generic, it's vanilla stop word list. Because again, the, the, the notion being, like when you, when you do news or when you do Wikipedia, when people write, it's editorially curated, meaning that they follow rules. If you compare that with Twitter, there are no rules. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand, too, where what your dictionary is and what type of, of writing that person is doing, because that affects the decisions you make and what dictionaries and what vocabulary you would include. So for pre-processing, I use, um, and I have sample code later, too. Uh, I use NLTK and GenSim. And then for vectorization, I just use GenSim's TFIDF vectorizer, and then for similarity computation, I just use cosine similarity in Jensen. So we talked about that. Generate the dictionary. Again, I use the Jensen corpora, which I just input the raw text from my Wikipedia. And then I generated the back of words model, doc to bow from Jensen again. And then the TFIDF model, TFIDF from Jensen. And the reason why I want to show this is I want to show this how, I want to show how you can generate a TF-IDF model in Jensen compared to how you can generate a TF-IDF model in scikit-learn. Because you can also do this in scikit-learn. But the reason why I, I chose Jensen for this was I didn't really want to do machine learning on this. I just wanted to get cosine similarity. So those are the decisions you have to make. So now that I, my, my thing is all vectorized, my Wikipedia articles are all vectorized, I'm going to project them into vector space. So how to explain? I'm sure you know, but humor me. So let's say you only have three, your universe, your vocabulary, you only have three words. Dog, cat, hat. 
right? And so your, your, your uh, vector, your dog one vector projects in between the dog, cat, hat. Your dog two vector projects between the dog, cat, and hat. And the distance between them represents how similar they are. Again, we can do this in Jensen. That's why I use Jensen, because I thought, oh, I can do everything in Jensen. So again, dog to bowl, your TFIDF, and you just do the similarity matrix. And then here you get the sorted enumerate similarities, and then you sort highest first. So at the end of the day, my example is Claudio Monteverde is similar to himself. Claudio Monteverde is similar to Giovanni, him, yes, is similar to him. <laughs> and so, uh, so on and so forth. So again, just cosine similarity. And this is a, a general information retrieval task. So that was our, that, that was Kindred, that was the Wikipedia. Now the second one was our, um, I call it triage. How do you pronounce it? Triage, right? So the second one was how do you triage the tweets? So again, let's go, let's go back to the first one, our first dark green pipeline. What's my ETL for this? So my ETL was, oh sorry, my ETL was a data source from a page from Crowdflower. So the Crowdflower is a site that has all the labeled data sets. It's, it's good if you want to, my suggestion, if you want to go practice with labeled data sets, Crowdflower and Kaggle has really good data sets. So Crowdflower, I got the data source with all the labeled uh, tweets. And then after that, it's CSV. I just did import CSV. And when I did the EDA, I did uh, scikit-learn and matplotlib. Mat, mat plot and I'll show you what I did with the EDA on that. And then for pre-process was tokenization. And the conversion was, um, I used scikit-learn and gensim. I actually experimented with this and, and um, thought, OK, should I use a count vectorizer, uh, word to vec, or a, um, what was the other one, a TF idea. And the classification, I, I just did simple linear, um, I just use a simple linear classifier. And I did scikit-learn for models and scores. So let me show you about the EDA. So in, in problems like this, you, uh, before you start anything, you kind of want to validate to yourself that do the words really classify what you think they classify, right? Do, do, the, wor do the words really say, oh, the evacuation word really means this or really means that, and how to do that? So what, and this is from a really good um, tutorial. I have all the links later too. Um, I'll send the link in. This is how he did this. What he did was he vectorized the words. So he all vectorized the words. And then he did a truncated SVD, which is a single, uh, single, value, comp single value decomposition. And so that flattens your matrix. So once the matrix is flattened, can you see? Uh, so what the, once the matrix is flattened, now you can see all the words in vectors in, in represented here in the graph. And you can see for the count vectorizer, what, what you're trying to see is, are they separable, right? Do the light, light colors cluster together? Because now if they're separable, that means that you can classify. So in the count vectorizer, you can see that they're all over the place. Doesn't look that, that clustered and that classifiable. The next one is the TF-IDF vectorizer. Now you see that now the colors cluster more together. Now you compare the TF-IDF vectorizer with a word to vec. So this is the probabilistic embedding. Now you can see, sorry. Now you can see that the word to vec has now more clusters. But at the same time, you have, you have the uh, things so close together. So let me ask you, what, which do you think got the highest score when I ran the model? Do you think it's a TF-IDF or the, or the word to vec? How much would you bet on that? <laughs> but do you think the word to that got the highest that higher classification score? So let me tell you. So the classification score for TFIDF was 78. Word to back was 77. <laughs> but but think about it. Go back to what I said at the very first. Be humanistic about it. When people are in a tragedy, they, they tweet very simply. They say person die under bridge, or they say bridge fall. 
when you say word duvet, it's usually how, you know, man, queen, or, you know, very, very uh, complex words that they use or complex representation. It kind of makes sense to me in a, in a really kind of weird way that the TF-IDF, the count uh, embedding work better because when people are, you know, when, when people are in distress, they tend to tweet simply and their words are simple. So you don't need nuance. And nuance is where word to back really, really goes well. So I wasn't kind of surprised, but plus I was like, oh, TF-IDF is cheaper to implement than word to back So that was that. So how was this done? So here is a simple count vectorizer. And now, if you notice, this is the scikit-learn implementation of the count vectorizer. Previously, we used the GenSim implementation. So here is you know, your test train split, and now you have your count vectorizers here. You have your X train counts, X, um, X test counts. And now here is where we did that nice visualization. Once we have those vectorized numbers, we now use this truncated SVD, which is here, SK learn decomposition import truncated SVD. I want to show it in two-dimensional space. And so that flattens <coughs> your N, you know, your, your, your really long vector. And then you fit, and then you display. You use a scatter plot, matplotlib, you display. I, there were some, you know, the labels, I just didn't add it there because I thought that was too, too much lines of coding. So you display, and that was what you saw. And, if, and I experimented, obviously, with TFIDF and with Zubek, and I generated the different graphs. And then for the classification, again, I just use simple logistic regression. This is simple logistic regression. I'm getting 78%. I haven't used deep learning. I haven't used you know, all those advanced yet. Again, let me again reiterate, you start with simple first. So now I get 78% on simple logistic regression. My intuition is if I use more advanced classification models, I get better scores. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> so here is your Jensen. This is how the, the probabilistic embedding was implemented. So here you download a pre-trained <coughs> corpus. So once again, we use Google, Google's pre-trained corpus, and this was trained on a news data set. I think it was 10 million news data set. So again, think about it. News is written in a different way than tweets. So you got a problem there right away off the bat. Maybe the volume would make up for it, but again, off the bat, you have some, some language issues there because how you tweet is different from how you write news articles. Or else your editor will not be very happy if you write the way you tweet. So uh, the next one is here. So I'll, put the, I'll, uh, publish, I'll publish the code if you guys are interested after. The next one is that one, and those are the references that I have, and what else? I have also the, some references on cleaning the text, code on cleaning the text, tokenizing the text, and also since I have time, I want to show you Spacey. So this is information extraction with Spacey. So in the, um, in the uh, example where we have the, uh, the example where we had the Wikipedia, so I use this one. So my, my thought, my intuition was, should I remove the entities? The reason being is, I don't, if I compare two documents in Wikipedia, does it, do the proper nouns make a difference or not? You know, do they add anything in the similarity matrix? So, so, I mean, do they add anything? So I was kind of experimenting on that, but I decided to put them anyway. But just to give you a sense of you know, the thought process that goes in into the whole NLP pipeline. It's not like, okay, I'm just gonna get a classifier. I'm gonna get a count vectorizer. You gotta know what tokens you wanna include, what tokens you don't want to include, and so on. And so that's that. Uh, any questions? Okay, we've got some questions here. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm just curious. So you mentioned the uh, three libraries for uh, NLP. Yeah, give me a second. Let me. 
So to do TFIDF, you mentioned three libraries that all do it. Yeah. I'm just wondering, the one liner in scikit-learn, is it right? It does all the steps. You gotta, put your you gotta put your dictionary first. You just get like by default everything yeah. set on default. The yes. vectorizer. Did you try it? Just to compare to the other uh, three methods. No, I did not. Okay. So no, I did not. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for your speech. Uh, uh, for someone newer to NLP, right, uh, would you recommend sticking to just one library first? Uh, it seems that you used the uh, NLTK for tokenization in both the Wikipedia and the Triage apps. Uh, can I just use Spacey and uh, do everything? Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I, have, I like single, single uh, word answers. Sorry, this is sensitive word answer. Okay. Uh, how long does it usually take for you to to come up with a concept for a model and then build it one? I'm sorry, say that again. So, um, how long does it usually take for you to think of a model or whatever NLP you want to do, and then until production or until you develop? So, how long does it? Let me rephrase. How long does it take for me to? to decide or think on a model, and then put it to production. It depends on the problem. So, at first I always try to do some EDA. I always try to do some exploratory data analysis. I always try to do some POC. I mean, especially if you're in industry, like you're, you're gonna get questioned a lot. Is this feasible? Do we wanna spend dollars, your, you know, your time, resources on this? So that's why by default, I spend a lot of time on EDA. So it depends on the scope of the problem. And also, I'm sorry, very important. The first one is, do I have the data? That's the, the, that's the first thing. And do I have the data? And now if I'm satisfied that I have the data, I do some EDA. That takes like probably 40% of the whole process. Finding, you know, finding if I have the data and then making the concept that, you know, can I do, do an EDA on the concept? That takes 40%. And now I have like 60% left, and it's just fiddling with the vectorizers and just fiddling with, if it's a, it's a classification model, just fiddling with that. But a lot of it is, is making sure I have quality data. All right, thank you. Okay, we have one more question over here. As someone who works with Twitter data quite a bit, because uh, since you work with Twitter data quite a bit, sure. Uh, do you have any rules of thumb in terms of how you deal with sarcasm or colloquialism? Oh, that's hard. Uh, that's that's a very that's a that's a very hard um, sarcasm is is very hard to to do. So what I normally what I normally do with sarcasm, I go to the deep learning models. They're they're more equipped to deal with that again with nuances. And then also I also make sure if I do supervised learning, that I have enough data. With sarcasm, um, I I tend to curate. I, I try to curate my training data and my testing data. See that I have good representation, so that uh, I just try to have as much data as possible. Uh, just one more, uh, follow up on that. Are there any pre-trained vectors on Twitter data that you recommend? You use the Google News vector for the yeah. for the for triage, but is there is there Twitter data vector? Pre-trained? I don't know if it's pre-trained on Twitter. I don't know. Okay. You probably have to make your own. And you can publish it in open source and it'll be very popular. The community will thank you. Okay, we have two more questions here. So uh, the first one, the catered one, uh, you did it on the English language. Uh, so when, if you try to do it in some other language, does it change the that. entire yes. landscape? Yes, I knew I would be asked that. So NLP, for now is very English focused, right? Most, if you go to NLTK, um, most, and if you go to other libraries, most of the pre-trained uh, models for tokenization, sentence boundary disambiguation, they're all trained in English. Um, except I think Spacey now has, supports several languages. I think Spacey is more progressive in terms of other languages compared to other libraries, just my opinion. Um, if it's another language, yes, my my decision making would change. Um, I would probably 
go to Spacely more because you know in terms of tokenization and all those it has it has more capabilities. I would be very uh, I'm very conscious about encoding. I'd be very conscious about you know flattening. Do I need to flatten if you have all these really wide character cases? Do I need to flatten all those? I'd be really conscious about that, and I'd probably spend more time on on that as well. And also some of the some of the algorithms I think don't work on as well as other languages because obviously you need the pre-trained models for that. So yes, short answer yes. So like on a more generic scale, uh, if I'm not a native speaker of any language, how can I do my ED in that language? Is it even possible? If I double my model in English, can so, I? I? So if I'm not a native speaker for any other language, is it possible to develop something in English and then go around uh, doing my EDA in that language? Or do I actually need some help from a native speaker? Well, ideally, if you can get help, I would suggest you get help. But if you don't get, if, you're, if you can get help on another language, uh, word to vec actually, the algorithm for word to vec can be language agnostic, right? Because when, when you have your own corpus and then you generate your own word to vec model, it can be language agnostic. So I would try, I would suggest to go the probabilistic route, so rather than the count route, but again, nothing beats having a domain expert. So my, my, if I may, one of my, um, one of my suggestions would be, if you cannot find a domain expert, be the domain expert, because you always have to have the domain expert, okay. ideally. All right, thank you. Okay, last question. Yeah, um, okay, thank you for the talk. Um, I just have a question about, um, Given this pipeline, uh, you already created the model, and how uh, could you share some advice on how to productionize as a scale? Oh yeah, for yeah. this pipeline, for sure. So how to pro let's uh, wow, I can talk about I can talk about how to productionize for hours, but I will try. For this pipeline, I cannot stress enough unit test. Because now, you know, when you're in data science, say, oh, I'm going just to do the algorithms, I'm just going to do this, I'm going to do that. I would just say unit test and do a, a, also a regression test. Also, another thing I want to, to suggest also is label your data. Label your training data. <laughs> label your featureized vectors. Save them, right? So you can redo the model again and again. And then if you have model one, two, three, you always make sure that it goes to training data one, two, three. And it goes to featureized vector one, two, three, and you save it in a database. So next time when you productionize it, you know which models are active, and when you know which models are active, it points to the data set that it was used to train on, because I've seen, again, I've seen instances when we have a model and we cannot train, because we don't know where the training data is. So label your model that corresponds to your training data, that corresponds to your featureized vector, unit test, um, always have a basic um, test cases where, you know, for classification, especially if you're, you have a bis uh, mission critical or a business critical um, model, make sure you put in your test case, you can, like, your classifier should always get these cases right. And you run the whole pipeline. So always make sure you have that as a backup because if your models change and, you know, business critical that your, your classifiers are always right on these five to ten items, then if your model fails on that, then you know you, you have to change your model. So um, there's, there's so many, uh, yeah. Okay, Laurie, thank you very sure. much. It's a great talk. Thanks for having us all.